And again, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our annual Florida Federalist Society Conference. Welcome to all 840 of you in attendance tonight. That is an incredible number. Outside of the National Lawyers Convention and some student national symposiums, I'm told this is now the largest event the Federalist Society hosts nationwide. Judge Oldham, you may want to tell our friends in Texas, as I know they have a Florida inferiority complex. Now, how far we've come. It was about eight years ago that Jason Gonzalez and Daniel Woodring and I started asking and then plain nagging Lisa Azell and anyone else who would listen about having a statewide conference here in Florida. We promised that there was a demand for this. We promised them that across this state there were lawyers who believed in the simple mission of the Federalist Society, to preserve our constitutional system by promoting due respect for and careful study of the separation of powers and the supremacy of written law. Well, after about two years of that and a very successful student symposium at UF, go Gators, we had some very positive signals. So, good old Jason Gonzalez took his personal credit card, put a non-refundable $25,000 deposit on this place, and we were off. And I think that's the first time Mrs. Gonzalez is hearing that story, so you might want to bring more wine to her table. Uh, and with the, Jason's leap of faith and the incredible confidence that Lisa Azell and others placed in us, uh, that all paid off. Our first conference was a success with about 200 people showing up. It has grown every year since. Traditions have formed, friendships have flourished, and now here we are for this incredible weekend. Now, in the newspaper editorial pages around the state, you will find some pretty wild claims about the Federal Society and what it's all about. But whatever success the Society has had has nothing to do with the conspiratorial flights of fancy of newspaper opinion writers. The Society's success is pretty simple to understand. It's rooted in the power of an idea. And it is not the Federal Society's idea, it is the American founding ideal, namely that the people are sovereign, that the government's power derives from the people and must be kept in check, and that the written law is supreme and cabins the power of officials, even judges. Those values frustrate some people who want to use the courts to bend the law to achieve what they cannot at the ballot box. But there's nothing conspiratorial about resisting that practice. It's a mission most Americans would agree with. Now, let me just say, when Justice Thomas comes up here, you're going to have to be quieter than this for those who are still talking in the back of the room. And I have the seating chart, so I know what you're up to back there. We're keeping names. So it's that idea, that commitment to the founding idea, that has made this conference and this organization so successful in Florida. And as with our prior conferences, tonight will be special, and so will the rest of the weekend. For the sixth year in a row, you will hear panels and speeches about important legal issues both timeless topics and those at the cutting edge of the law. During those panels and speeches, you will hear many perspectives, as you always do at Federalist Society events. You will hear people come at issues from the left and from the right, from somewhere in between, from a historical perspective, an economic perspective, and an academic perspective, and a practicing lawyer's perspective. This is a debating society, and at our conferences, all reasoned viewpoints are welcome, and no one is heckled, shouted down, or canceled for having an unpopular perspective. Now, there's something you won't hear this weekend. You won't hear the Federalist Society's positions on any topics. You won't hear that because the Federalist Society doesn't take positions on specific issues. Indeed, this weekend, you will not see Federalist Society membership vote on policy platforms. You won't see the Society authorize lobbying positions. You won't see the Society plan amicus briefs to be filed in contentious cases. And you won't see the Society evaluate or rate judicial nominees as qualified or unqualified. You won't see and hear those things because the Federalist Society doesn't do them. If you want that kind of advocacy in politics, you need to make your way to the closest meeting of the American Bar Association. <laughs> Anyhow, this is why the Federalist Society's events have become so popular in Florida and elsewhere. 
We offer something you don't typically find at your average bar association, true and rigorous debate. Now, to be perfectly candid, we also have another reason for this large crowd tonight. It is because of our guest of honor, Justice Clarence Thomas. We have hoped for several years to have a Supreme Court Justice headline this conference, and this year we finally did it. This year we are joined by, to my mind, the greatest living American public figure. Thank you, Justice Thomas, for your service. We are also joined tonight by Governor Ron DeSantis. He is a Federalist Society member of long standing all the way back to his law school days. Governor, thank you for being here. Thank you for your eloquence in repeatedly and pu publicly explaining the ideals this group seeks to promote. And thank you for appointing judges and justices who believe in those ideals too. We are also fortunate tonight to be joined by Judge Greg Katsis of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. <laughs> Judge Katsis has had an illustrious career previously serving as Deputy White House Counsel and in several senior posts at the U.S. Department of Justice. In private practice, Judge Katsis's cases brought him to the Sunshine State so often that we have long considered him and Mrs. Katsis honorary Floridians. So let me just say to them both, welcome back. Judge Katsis, who was one of Justice Thomas's first law clerks, will be the interlocutor during tonight's conversation. We are also joined this evening by our many speakers who will be featured this weekend. Don McGahn, the former White House counsel, Judges Bill Pryor, Branch, Grant, Luck, and Lagoa from the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. <laughs> Judge Andrew Oldham from the 5th Circuit Court of Appeals. <laughs> Florida Supreme Court Justices Alan Lawson and Carlos Muniz. and federal district judges Trevor McFadden and Rudy Ruiz. Thanks to all of them. Thanks to all of them for being here and thanks to the many other speakers, judges, public officials, lawyers, experts in their fields who will shape, help shape our discussions at this conference. And let me also provide very special thanks to the people who put so much time into making this year's conference happen. I already mentioned Jason Gonzalez, who has dedicated countless hours over the past year to make this weekend a reality. Jason, thank you very much. And likewise, and perhaps most importantly, we could not put this conference on without the tireless efforts of Lisa Azell and her staff and all of the chapter leadership around the state. You cannot imagine how much time and effort it takes to put a weekend and a banquet like this together. So thank you, Lisa. Thank you, everyone who pitched in. And finally, thanks to all of you, the members and guests of the Federalist Society, for spending your weekend here with us in Orlando. If this is your sixth time here, you are in for the best conference yet. If this is your first time here, I think you'll be very pleased and you'll be back next year. So ladies and gentlemen, friends and honored guests, thank you for being here. Please enjoy your salads and appetizers while we proceed with the program. And to help move us along on the program, I am honored to invite to the stage Catherine Kimball Mizell. Kat is an attorney at the Jones Day Law Firm where she is a member of the issues and, issues and appeals practice. But she also has a special claim to fame as a Floridian. She is the first Gator to clerk at the U.S. Supreme Court, where she helped <laughs> where she helped our guest of honor, Justice Thomas, produce his excellent opinions throughout the October 2018 term. And before that, she clerked for Judge Katsis on the D.C. Circuit. And before that, she clerked for Judge Pryor on the 11th Circuit. 
So because of her close working relationship with our two conversationalists tonight, and because of her achievements as a Florida lawyer, Kat is the perfect person to provide a few introductory insights about what it's like to work with Justice Thomas and Judge Katzis. And she will also introduce our governor. Kat, thank you for being here. The stage is yours. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here um, and really deeply honored to get to say a few words about Justice Thomas, Judge Katzis, um, and Governor DeSantis. As Jesse mentioned, I am a proud native Floridian, born and raised in Polk County, as was my husband, Chad. Yeah, Polk County. Uh, before I share what it was like to clerk for these two remarkable jurists, uh, I think it's helpful to explain the somewhat circuitous path I took to get there. When I entered UF for law school, I had no idea what a clerkship was. Uh, but thankfully, a few professors of mine encouraged me to apply to clerk on the Court of Appeals. So I started researching, and I found this one judge. He was bold, principled, and he held no punches. Uh, his name was William H. Pryor Jr., and I thought, that's who I want to clerk for. Um, so I applied, and thankfully, uh, Judge Pryor uh, hired me, and that decision really changed the trajectory of my career. After clerking for Judge Pryor, he encouraged me to apply to the U.S. Supreme Court, and in particular to Justice Thomas, because he considered graduates like myself who didn't go to an Ivy League university. So by day, I joined the Department of Justice and was a federal prosecutor, and by night, I studied the original meaning of the Constitution, like whether paper money was constitutional. Um, it, it's not. Um, <laughs> Uh, two years after applying, I found myself uh, sitting in front of Justice Thomas interviewing. And then two years after that, I found myself starting a clerkship with him. In the interim, President Trump nominated Judge Greg Katzis to the DC Circuit. I am convinced that there is no human being better suited to serve on that court. For those of you who have, yes. Judge Katzis was truly made to be a DC Circuit judge. Um, and I had the very unique privilege of getting to be one of his first law clerks, um, as he was the justices, one of his first clerks. And in fact, Judge Katzis has Justice Thomas's old chambers at the DC Circuit. What really stands out about clerking for Judge Katzis, though, is his character. He is earnest to a fault, eager to engage with the law, a spirited debater, a generous listener, and a gracious mentor. Despite the little sleep and somewhat tight timelines we had in those first few months as we were playing catch up, he remained patient with all of his clerks and he never uh, let his stress impact how he treated um, advocates. Judge Katzis gave me a, a clear example of what kind of lawyer I wanna be. Now for the hard part, as Jesse already mentioned, um, I have to describe what it's like to clerk for the greatest living American and I mean that with all sincerity. It goes without saying that to join the Thomas clerk family is quite intimidating. You're inheriting a torch that's been carried for 30 years by legal giants in their own right, including Judge Katzis. And you, more than anything else, want to honor the justice by defending the Constitution. Thomas Clerk see it as an act of patriotism. It's one, you're one year to serve your country. And you do so without sleep happily for that year. Other Supreme Court clerks may say the same thing, but I think there's something different in the Thomas Chambers, and I think that's the justice himself. In particular, I think there are two virtues that set Justice Thomas apart. First is his courage. Justice Thomas has taken the commitment to originalism to new heights. Justice Scalia once called him a bloodthirsty originalist, <laughs> which maybe wasn't meant as a compliment, but I really think it is one. Justice Thomas lives out his principles regardless of the outcome, and he has the courage to say the unpopular, even if he's the only one saying it. Second, and I think this is most unique, is joy. Justice Thomas does his job with an infectious joy, as anyone who has heard him laugh knows. And because he has so much joy, I loved going to work. And although it was perhaps the hardest year of my life in terms of work, it was also the one where I laughed the most too. I remember one day we were being particularly loud and Justice Kagan uh, walked down the hallway, uh, presumably to scold me for the noise. And then she realized that Justice Thomas was in the chambers with us and she said, what is happening in here? To which Justice Thomas said, we're working. <laughs> and quite frankly, that was true all year. We worked, we laughed, and we never gave up. Clerking for Justice Thomas meant that I got to know a man for whom I have the greatest respect both as a person and as a jurist. 
and who has given me a model of how to live out the virtues of courage and joy. I now have the additional honor to get to welcome the governor of the great state of Florida. Governor DeSantis's overwhelming success in the first two years of his governorship is well known and extraordinary. The unemployment rate is at a historic low. Our public universities are ranked number one in the nation. Our crime rate is an um, almost 50 year low and the governor is leading our state into great economic prosperity. Each of these efforts in their own is remarkable, but I'd like to hi highlight one particular accomplishment. On the campaign trail, Governor DeSantis said he was going to appoint justices to the Florida Supreme Court in the mold of Justice Thomas, and he did exactly that. He did such a good job that President Trump stole two of them, I guess, for the 11th Circuit. <laughs> Um, we can be immensely proud to have a governor so committed to the rule of law that he selects jurists of such a high caliber and we know he will do so again. Please welcome, or join me in welcoming Governor DeSantis. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank y'all. Please be seated. Please be seated. Thank you for that introduction. It's my pleasure to be here uh, to announce my next two appointments. Oh, no, just kidding. <laughs> but stay tuned. Even better than announcing appointments, I get to welcome to the great state of Florida our great Justice Clarence Thomas. And um, Clarence Thomas to me means a number of things, but certainly an unwavering adherence to his constitutional oath. It means intellectual integrity, and it means somebody that has the courage of his convictions. Now, we talk about originalism, and sometimes that's just put out as like, oh, this is, I want to be an originalist, maybe not, as if there's some kind of a choice. And I think Justice Thomas, more than any other justice, um, has understood that it's not something you simply choose to do, it's something that is uh, inherent in the constitutional oath and in our system. You know, Alexander Hamilton in The Federalists uh, remarked that judges have neither force nor will, but merely judgment. Um, and he was pointing out that this is a limited role, important, uh, but certainly not a role where you're going to usurp powers of the other branches. And what Justice Thomas has pointed out is if the job of the judge is something, anything other than simply applying the law and constitution as written, then the Founding Fathers would probably not have adopted a written constitution to begin with. The British Constitution, which they were very familiar with and actually supportive of, you know, as colonists, and, and, and they relied on some of that for their rights, for our, our rights in the Bill of Rights, and, and, and even uh, if reflected in the structural constitution, it was unwritten. An unwritten constitution, it evolved over time, you had judges, a lot of common law improvisation. Um, they chose here in the United States not to do that, uh, to have a written constitution and then charge the judge with deciding a case or controversy under that constitution um, and under the laws of the United States. And I think that understanding uh, is one of the reasons why Justice Thomas is, is the clearest thinker uh, with respect to the original understanding of the Constitution, but also for things like stare decisis and the role that precedent plays uh, for a judge, particularly a judge of, on a court of last resort. And Justice Thomas has pointed out correctly that when you take the oath to the Constitution, your oath is to get it right and to apply the Constitution correctly. There are right answers to these questions and there are wrong answers to these questions. And if you have a series of judicial decisions, uh, while that's something you can consider, the judicial gloss does not supersede the text of the Constitution itself. And you just need to look throughout American history to understand that you know, judges are fallible, courts are fallible, they do get it wrong. Um, you, know, you can look at how Lincoln critiqued the Dred Scott decision, you could look up uh, in some of the more modern innovations where judges have injected themselves into social uh, issues uh, to understand that there are times when you need to get it right. And I think the justice, more than anybody else, has been willing to do that in ways that are constitutionally correct, 
but potentially disruptive to current legal thinking. Uh, he's one of the few justices who has gone back and looked at the errors of cases after the Civil War, like the Slaughterhouse cases, and has uh, been willing to breathe life into the Privileges and Immunities Clause. Uh, he's also been willing to faithfully apply the Constitution's Commerce Clause. Uh, if you remember his concurrence in the United States versus Lopez, there was an issue of all these cases over decades and decades have said anything that has any substantial effect on commerce that Congress can simply regulate. It's akin to basically a police power, which the Founding Fathers rejected. And they're arguing about all this, and the Justice points out, if the Constitution, if the framers wanted to empower Congress to do anything that had a substantial effect on, Congress, on, on, on uh, commerce, why would they have enumerated all those specific places in the Constitution where there were specific powers dealing with con uh, commerce? The substantial effects would have subsumed all of that. And so these are very clear, uh, precise, insights, but it's something that was not met with a lot of fanfare in, say, the legal academy. Uh, but at the end of the day, this is a justice that has the courage of his convictions, and he's willing to apply the Constitution, you know, regardless of any criticism uh, that he may face uh, about it. And when you're in that seat, uh, the best way to be liked is to kowtow to the elites and the media and in academia. You will be lauded for that, but you will be lauded when you depart from the Constitution. You will be lauded when you depart from the text, history, and structure of the founding documents. And that is something that Justice Thomas refuses to do. And I think that... And I think that if the judicial oath means anything, uh, the adherence to the Constitution and to that oath is more important than generating praise from observers in the cheap seats. And I don't think anybody has embodied that as much as Justice Thomas. Now, there's some who say that um, it's important to, quote, protect the court's legitimacy, quote, unquote, and that that requires a judge to, in effect, calibrate decisions uh, with an eye towards the public reaction that those decisions might face, particularly partisan criticism. Uh, that is not something that Justice Thomas would accept. He understands and demonstrates day after day that the way to ensure the court's legitimacy is to make sure its decisions are grounded in the text of the Constitution itself. External considerations cannot trump what the law says, it cannot trump what the Constitution means. After all, if we're calibrating decisions based on popular response, why would judges have life tenure in the first place? The entire reason they have life tenure is because they're supposed to apply the Constitution regardless of which way the wind blows. So on issue after issue, enforcement of Second Amendment rights, the rejection of so-called nationwide injunctions, which are very much a part uh, of the news now, the defense of the Constitution's structural limitations, and the vindication of we the people's right to defend things like our border and to protect life, and many, many others, Justice Thomas is the court's leading light. And if you don't care about the law, if you don't care about the Constitution, this is a guy that you should still view as an inspiration because of his background as somebody who grew up poor in Pinpoint, Georgia in the segregated South, um, not given probably a lot of prospects to be very successful, and yet through a lot of grit and determination and hard work, uh, he ends up not just on the Supreme Court, uh, but somebody that people who care about the Constitution all across the country look to as the authority, and when you're thinking about decisions and they come down, not knowing anything about the facts of the case, if Thomas is on one side of that, 99% of the time, maybe more, you figure that must be the right side of the case to come out on. And,
And so I, I think we're very fortunate to be able to uh, have somebody uh, of his caliber here uh, in the state of Florida at this conference. And this is a major, huge conference with so many great people. And uh, I know if you go back 10 or 15 years, you would not have had this many people. Um, but it really is an honor uh, to welcome him here. Uh, and so I look forward to having him come up here and share his thoughts with you, because I do think he is our greatest living justice. Thank you. Justice Thomas, welcome to Florida. <laughs> I'm going to uh, set my timer so that I can hold you to the red light. <laughs> um, Is my mic on? Can you, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. OK. Well, that's the, that's the important part. Yeah. I think it, it comes on and off, doesn't it? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. okay. Welcome to Florida. Thank you. I, I've been in Florida now for a week. Uh, yeah. Welcome to the Federalist Society. Yeah. Um, um, we, um, I was fortunate. Can you hear? Yeah, Don had this. Don had this issue too. Yeah, I prefer this. This is not working. Can I have one? Huh. Is it on? Yes, it's on. Oh. We'll try try again. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So, boss, you had expressed an interest in talking about our two years together, uh, which we'll do. But I have to start um, at the beginning. Um, you've got such a compelling, compelling life story. I want to make sure everyone knows all about that. Um, you were born poor um, in the segregated South. Um, everything stacked against you. Um, tell us what, it, what your life was like at the beginning. Well, I'm not going to, if I get too much into it, it sounds like a blues song, so. <laughs> <laughs> not, the, um, the, the, and it's embarrassing to talk too much about it. But first of all, thank you all for inviting uh, Judge Katsas and me here. Uh, uh, Judge Katz is, is very special to me. He and his wife, Simone, in fact, all my clerks are. I just spent um, uh, a, a week in, at the University of Florida with, um, with uh, Catherine Mazzell, uh, whom you just heard from, the clerk for both of us, and we had a blast. Um, and I also got a chance to spend over an hour with um, Mary Wise um, and gave her all my knowledge of volleyball. <laughs> <laughs> that was a delight. But no, it was, uh, and seriously, it was a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. And it, give, it, it sort of gives you a perspective when you get out of Washington uh, that your work is the Im impact or the, the effect of your work and how important it is, and meeting, seeing these young people who were so engaged and so interested in uh, understanding. We were doing the religion clauses, which are 
if you look at our jurisprudence, it's a morass. So, but even that, with that, they were engaged and, and excited about it. So to get back to your um, question, you know, I, I was blessed to have had the life that I've had. Uh, I have zero complaints. I was fortunate to be raised by the two greatest people ever, uh, my uh, Myers and Christine Anderson. Uh, things didn't start out, and that's the beauty of this country, that things can start out and not seem so great, but because this is the land of possibilities and opportunity, uh, we, it gives us a fighting chance. And the, it doesn't always work out. My grandfather often said there was no guarantee, but you have a chance. And here we have a chance. We had an opportunity to be in Indonesia this summer. And you see those young kids, I saw lots of young kids on some of the more distant islands who lived the life and, uh, that I grew up living, uh, right at the edge, uh, uh, running, jumping in the water, uh, uh, just uh, poverty. But unlike here, that was it for them. Uh, they, their chances were significantly different from being in this country. So I think what I really, as bad as things look, uh, we always were told that we had a chance. And the road map, according to my grandfather, was what he was going to talk, teach us. But the thing that we had no control over is the fact that we were blessed to have been born in this country and not in Indonesia, not in some of the countries where the possibilities are limited or the chance of you doing things are less than likely or p perhaps improbable, if not impossible. He instilled in you a great sense of discipline. There's a, there's a great line in your book in which you say when you moved in with him at, what, maybe seven or so, he said, well, the damn party's over. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. It didn't sound like there was much of a party, but tell us, tell us how it ended. Well, his, well he... he he believed that, his, his view was that we lived in, in the tenements and when we showed up, we had not spent much time. I had not gone to school very much. We wandered, I wandered the streets. My brother wasn't in school yet. And he, his, his view was that that, that was that wandering around was foolishness. So he did look at it, he was a big man and his exact quote, and you're close, uh, was the damn vacation is over. And we always, <laughs> We wondered what was the vacation when I mean, you're living in a tenement. Uh, but he saw it as a vacation. He said, from now on, there will be manners and behavior and rules and regulations. And that's the way it was. And he was also clear, like the old days, you know, that uh, there was the right way, the wrong way, and his way. And, <laughs> and the, the, there were other rules, like, you know, the teachers are always right. And that doesn't work today. That's the, the teachers are always wrong. <laughs> but the uh, the and, and he his warning was if you complained about the nuns uh, who he encouraged to use corporal punishment, <laughs> <laughs> if you complained about them, then that would mean that you got an additional punishment. And uh, so you could you could imagine that that was sort of a ch had a chilling effect on complaint. <laughs> But it was just, you know, I, I look back at my life, and it, there are things, there are challenges, but to have had those great people, uh, that's the, the, and to have had those nuns, and to have had the neighborhood. I was walking through my old neighborhood with a friend a few months ago, and I had not done that in years. Uh, I had slipped away from those who have security concerns. And and because uh, I should not be wandering through the neighborhood, but but it was absolutely great. You you feel like you've escaped. But the I you know it, I said I was telling my friend that it occurred to me that none of the people I knew in that neighborhood uh, were functionally literate, and yet they were the best people that I've known. 
Uh, they were the people who gave us the values. They were the people who believed in the possibilities of this country. They were the people who told us we had to get our education. And think of today, of all the negativity that's being fed people who have struggles, who are being told that you can't make it, who are being told that uh, the whole world's against you. And my grandfather's view was that you look at the things that you could do. They gave us hope. They gave us a life of hope. Even though you looked around and the evidence did not suggest hope. Why were they so hopeful? They were hopeful. He would always look for things, basic things, for which to be thankful. Uh, he would say, we, we had the little cheap porcelain table that we all remember from that generation, where if you drop something, pieces would pop up and then there'd be a little black spot on it. But we would sit at that table and he would say, look at all we have to be grateful for. We have a roof over our head, we had food on the table, and we have clothes on our back. There were always those three things. And beyond that, he felt that uh, the rest was bonus. You had your health, you had friends, you had a job. Um, but the, today, think of the litany of, en the endless litany of complaints that we have. And I just think that they gave us something that was positive, that gave us, that even under the extant circumstances that did not particularly look hopeful, they gave you this endless supply of hope and reasons for hope and possibilities that you could create that were there and that you could create for yourself. And your early education came from the nuns whom you've spoken about, at probably at a time where a lot of folks like you weren't getting educated in the public schools. Uh, that, was that the start of your now very deep religious faith? I think it's, you know, it's, it's I'm Catholic, but Everybody around you was religious. Even the people who didn't go to church were religious. Uh, and the, there was something deeply embedded that um, it, that was an important part of our lives. My grandmother, who was a saint, Christine Anderson, was Baptist, Southern Baptist. My grandfather, who did not like a lot of preaching and staying in church a long time, he would say, boy, all that hooping and hollering, I'm not for that. So he, um, he, he became Catholic, and then he would say things to me, because we were, we were captives on the oil truck when we delivered fuel oil, and in those days, kids could only be spoken to. You couldn't speak. You couldn't initiate a con conversation. So he would say things like, boy, everything starts with boy. <laughs> boy, if God knows everything, why do you have to stay in church more than an hour? <laughs> so, so we had deep theological discussions too. <laughs> and you know, under my breath, because you did not say anything, you were a kid. I would say, if God knows everything, why go at all? <laughs> but uh, notice I said nothing. <laughs> there was, so you um, began studying for the seminary. You went to seminary, began studying for the priesthood, and then um, changed course. You tell about you tell some anecdotes about hearing, um, being exposed to some ugly thoughts and it, um, statements directed your way. Um, you became what you called in your book an angry black man. So tell us about those years. And well, those years, those years didn't last as long. Uh, and the, you know, that's, I think, wheels come, come off the wagon sometime. In, in the late 1960s, things were changing in the society. And it was easy to be angry. And um, I'm not justifying it. I'm just simply saying that was a part of life. And the race issue is a very sensitive issue. It's a core issue with me. Um, one of the uh, hard, 
uh, things about going to the University of Florida or going to the University of Georgia or LSU or some of these beautiful campuses now is that it reminds you of what you couldn't do. Um, the, I, I remember making a trip to, with my wife to, in the, right after you clerked, uh, to West Point, which I had dearly wanted to go to. But I, there was no way I was going to get an appointment to West Point. And it is, that it's one thing in theory to know that you couldn't go. It's another thing to see the reality of it, to see that beautiful campus overlooking the Hudson. It's to go to the University of Florida and see those beautiful live oak trees and azaleas and, and magnolia trees and know that you could not be there or go to Athens. So I think what happened in the late 60s was the realization that no matter how well I did, there was this wall and that I, it, my reaction was not a positive reaction. It was what you, I was a kid, I was impetuous. So yes, I did become angry. I went off the rails a while. It caused additional problems, particularly with my grandfather who had no tolerance for that, uh, who felt he had not raised me that way. Uh, to be angry, to be bitter, to be negative. And, but you know, the good part of it was there was enough residual, uh, there, there were enough residual lessons from my life that brought me back to stability. It's like a boat, a, a, a sailboat being pushed to one side, but coming back to right. Um, and I think a part of that was what I had been taught it was the, the faith that had been instilled in me. And I, I truly believe that I never totally got away from the belief that this was the country that you would forever have these possibilities in. So I think I found myself wrestling with that. I was almost at war with myself. So, but I, that ended in the 70s. And it began this sort of long journey to thinking through why this wonderful country, why this constitution. And, and it raised a lot of questions. And what were the, 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 you had this inconsistency. You had the race issue, which was at war with the ideal. And how do we reconcile these two? How do we reconcile finally the contradictions that we, that, that we have allowed to happen throughout our history. So a lot of what you see, uh, Governor DeSantis mentioned the Privileges or Immunities Clause. There's, a, there's an opportunity to reconcile it in the 14th Amendment, but not when you start reading provisions out, not when you start pretending things aren't there, not when you start pretending we didn't actually have this history. You don't have to be obsessed with the negatives, but it's there. And we have an opportunity. We have an obligation, I think, when we see it. You believe the same thing. We've had these discussions. We have an obligation. The ideal is in this document. It's in the Declaration. It's in the written Constitution. And it's built in this culture for us to move the right direction. But if we don't... I think, we've, I think we, we allow other people to, to dominate the conversation uh, in a negative way when we have the higher ground with this noble document. So let's talk about the positive. Um, the sailboat writes, you attended, graduated from Yale Law School, graduated uh, maybe around age 25, and um, in less than... 20 years, uh, you're on the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, there were people when you were nominated who said, well, he doesn't have much experience. Um, in fact, though... I was one of those people. Uh, well, <laughs> but, but you had worked in the private sector. You had worked in state government. 
uh, as an assistant attorney general for Jack Danforth. You had worked at the federal level in the legislative branch for Senator Danforth. Uh, you had run an executive agency uh, in, the, in the executive branch, um, and you had served on the DC circuit. Um, pretty amazing sequence of jobs. Um, do you have a, um, do you have a favorite of, jo of all those? Oh, favorite job would be working uh, for the Attorney General in Missouri. My next question, I think, I wasn't sure about the answer to that one. I was pretty sure about the answer to the next one, which is, did you have a favorite boss? So uh, that would be Jack so Danforth. Tell us about Senator Danforth. You know, the, the cat mentioned some things that um, that were really it's, it's humbling to to hear one of your kids talk about her time uh, in a very difficult job. But the thing that I learned, I liked about Jack Danforth. Remember, I was he and I were never really politically aligned. I was never really much into politics. He was just a good and decent man. He was a man who never asked us to do things that were unprincipled. That's what I learned from him. And remember, when I worked for him, I was still very cynical. Right. And, but you watch him, how he treated us, uh, the things that he believed in, that how positive he was, how he was optimistic about our country, now, did you have to agree with him on how he was going to reach those things? No. But the things that I do remember as a politician, he never compromised our integrity. He never asked us to do anything wrong. So one of the things that I promise my law clerks each year, all four of them, is that when they leave the chambers, they will have clean hands, clean hearts, and clear consciences. And you know, it's one thing, one of the beauty of sitting here with you and knowing that you clerked for me in two jobs right. is to know that I can look you in the eye and we never have to lie to each other. We never have to pretend that we didn't do something underhanded because we know we were always above board. Let's talk about you're becoming a judge. Um, I've done some things that you've done. I've now gone on the DC circuit. Um, I was struck at the sort of magnitude and finality of making a lifetime commitment, a professional lifetime commitment. Um, I did that at age 55 you did it at age 41. Um, and it was a completely different job from being in the executive branch. So um, how did you decide that you wanted to be a judge and, and make that great leap of faith? Well, I never really decided I wanted to be a judge. But I did, and this for some people will sound odd, but. I wanted to be a priest, so you, you've already made a commitment to do something for life. That didn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought about later on, after I regained my balance, to go back into the seminary. But there was one problem. I had a wife. <laughs> and I kind of like her a lot. <laughs> so <laughs> and, um, but you know, seriously, uh, I think that I, in the early 1980s, when I told you that I had changed courses, I have left that up to God to uh, determine what he wants me to do and what he's calling me to do. Uh, I stopped making these long-term plans and tried to figure out, to be discerning, what, is, what does God want me to do? So that's how I wound up on the DC circuit and I thought he got me in a fix when I was nominated to the court, but he never got me in anything he didn't get me out of, and he got me out of that mess. Um, the, 
But I truly, it may sound a little bit strange, but uh, I never really thought that deeply about it. Uh, that uh, my view is that if this is what God wants me to do, I'm being called to do, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, if he wants me, if I've been called to take an oath to do something, then I'm going to do it. Uh, it's not that complicated to me. Um, I think we think about this. Would we, you and I are not in the Middle East at 19 years old fighting for our lives. We've not been deployed. We're not in harm's way. And doing a job sitting in air condition for the rest of our lives is not the worst thing that could happen to us. And, and, and during my clerkship sitting in the very room that I now occupy as a judge watching on television as yeah. American service members were yeah. making that commitment. You know, I remember you being very agitated about that. But I remember you being very agitated about a lot of things. <laughs> I was young. <laughs> I've calmed down now, somewhat. You know, so Judge Katz is, is, a, is unable to, um, he is who he is. And he's not a poker face person. So um, he would say things like, there's something strange going on in one of the chambers. There's something really strange. Yep. <laughs> and there was. <laughs> and or he would, um, he, 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 Judge Katz has also informed me that Justice Marshall had retired. And his arms were up just as Marshall is retired. And Judge Katz has also informed me when I thought I had dodged a bullet in being nominated to the Supreme Court. Uh, he, we were at work one, that Sunday. Sunday and, morning. Judge, Kenneth Bunkport's on the line. So let me give you a hint. If a place calls you, do not take the call. <laughs> You took the call. I took the, yeah, and you see what happened to worked me. Out, yeah. <laughs> worked, out, worked out pretty well. So I, I, I struggled with questions about the DC Circuit year. I wish I could ask you about Baker Hughes. All the great cases we did, but the <laughs> fact of the matter is you weren't there very long, yeah. and most of our cases were pretty boring. They weren't. I thought those were important cases. I, okay. Um, do you have any particular memories of that court? Nope. <laughs> okay. Like, uh, like Kat said, he's honest. Um, no, I love the D.C. Circuit. I loved you all. I loved going out, walking for our walks. Uh, I loved talking about the cases. Uh, learning the law in a different way instead of being a policy maker. I thought it was great. And, uh, and I love getting my furniture in that I never got to use. <laughs> mine, mine is being installed uh, literally. Well, be careful, uh, you may get nominated. Right now. No, oh, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm much too old for that. Um, one of the most consequential things um, you might have done that year was a bit of career advice you gave someone. Um, one of my good friends uh, from that clerkship year um, had decided that he would go back to his hometown in New Jersey and go back to an old law firm and start a family and have a very conventional life. And uh, a public interest opportunity popped up and he was not really inclined to take it, but he hadn't definitively rejected it. Um, he had spent some time in our chambers and gotten to know you a little bit and he came in to ask you for some career advice. Um, that person uh, was Leonard Leo and the um, and the 
public interest opportunity was to take a job at the Federalist Society. So um, what did you tell Leonard? You know, the, um, those were wonderful times. That's what, you know, you talk about it. Uh, DC Circuit didn't last long, but just think of the lasting bonds we've made. And uh, Leonard um, asked which job, and uh, I asked him where was his heart, and he said with the Federalist Society. And I said, you should go do that, uh, and, and he did. And look at the difference it's made. And the rest is history. Yeah. <laughs> but Leonard also then became my first adopted clerk. Right. And um, of course, we have been family ever since, from the birth of all of his children to um, many, many times together, the christening, the, the baptism, right. first communion. So he and Sally are a dear part of our lives, a dear part of yours, as is Simone. So it's just, uh, Leonard has been very, very special. Let's talk about October term, 1991. Pretty tough year. Yep, um, I didn't have really good law clerks that year. Uh, <laughs> That, that makes it even harder. <laughs> um, amazing to, I, I, I look back on what things were like the whole year, but really at, especially at the beginning. So um, justice was confirmed to the court. Um, he was 43 years old. Um, he had he was relatively new, even as a judge. Um, he had been through a very ugly, draining confirmation process. Uh, two of the four of us were um, new to the Supreme Court, and we didn't have the luxury of a summer to learn how to write pool memos. Um, there were all of the accumulated um, cert work that you had to do. There was the finishing up of the DC circuit work, which we couldn't do because you weren't around all summer. And we were trying to get the chambers stood up uh, two weeks before the November sitting. How in the world did you make that work? I think it's by the grace of God. And, uh, you know, you were there, we put our heads down, and we did it. And I, it was very special, I mean, as difficult as it is, look how it's bonded us. And we learned a lot, uh, we got through it, it was a brutal year, and I don't think we've had a year like that, but look at the, 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 the foundation that we laid that year, the things that we thought about. Uh, and it wasn't an easy term. We had a lot more cases. Right. Uh, and, the, and some of them were very, very hard. That was a term of Hudson, of Fuchsia, of uh, Casey. Right. Uh, and so you had, whether it was um, the cruel and unusual punishment clause or abortion, it was all there. And we had to learn on the fly. We didn't have systems. But you know, I was 43. There was a lot more energy. We didn't sleep a whole lot. Right. Uh, That's for sure. You slept there. I know you did. A few nights. A few, yes. I mean, that's so, uh, we had a lot of sleepless nights. But again, I point to, I just finished reading uh, this year. Uh, when you have law clerks, you get to read a lot of different things. Uh, the, I just finished reading uh, E.B. Sledge's book, The Old Breed. And we, have, we did nothing compared to what that kid during, did on Peleliu and Okinawa. Uh, the, you, you feel humbled when you read what we have required other people to do for us to be able to sit here in peace. Uh, <laughs> The, 
the end, I just wish that, you know, the, um, we do the wreaths across America uh, each year. And when you see the young people who have lost their limbs and lost lives, the wounded warriors, uh, any inconvenience that we have endured pales in comparison. When you see, uh, you go up to Arlington and you see all those who's, who've given the last full measure, uh, or who are mortally wounded. Uh, I have done very little. Uh, and I think that year was tough, but not even close in comparison to what they have done. That's a great point. I won't pretend that any of us judges who work in air-conditioned rooms and, and have personal protection and everything else that comes with the job um, are even in the same league as the men who wear the uniform. But as judges go, um, let's talk about what you did. Do you remember the first sitting? No. Well, I will, well, I will tell you about it. So, um, so I can, I can go into, I can go into a lot of detail here, um, because Justice Blackman saw fit to disclose all of the internal court confidences that would otherwise prevent me from talking about this. Not Harry. Um, I have talked about this in smaller groups, and, and Jan Crawford has written very powerfully about this. But um, the justices first sitting, coming into the court in the extraordinarily difficult, again, by judge standards, not by soldier standards, the extremely difficult circumstances he was in. Um, he went into his first sitting. Would have been the easiest thing in the world for him to keep his head down, try to find his bearings, not make waves. He was the sole dissenting vote in not one, not two, but three cases, Dawson versus Delaware. Well, that was the guy who, that, yeah. So that one, that That's one. the guy who claimed to be an altar boy? That one came out. The Aryan Brotherhood eight to guy. one. So, <laughs> so question presented is, guy's committed of capital murder. He tries to avoid the death penalty by putting on evidence about how he baked cookies or whatever, and the government tries to counter that evidence with competing evidence that yeah. he was a member of a, an Aryan Brotherhood prison gang. Mm. And uh, the court, in its wisdom, struck the sentence, and you, you were the sole dissenter. Oh. Should we take a poll and like how many people <laughs> thought you were right? Um, that one came out eight to one. Um, Hudson versus McMillian came out seven to two. You managed to pull Justice Scalia. Um, that, was, that was the Eighth Amendment case for which the New York Times dubbed you the cruelest justice. Youngest and the cruelest. Youngest and cruel. Did you read that op-ed? No, never did. But it sounds but like... you knew you what know, it said. You know, I like that because it sounds like um, the, the young and the restless. Yeah. <laughs> Brought to you by Tide. <laughs> um, and, and the last one of those eight, eight to ones uh, was Fuchsia, which came out five to four. Oh, you yeah. pulled Scalia, and you pulled the old chief, and you pulled Kennedy. But that was still another loss. Another loss. Yeah, like I said, it was a tough year. I know, but look at the progress. No votes, two votes, four votes. 
right? Make little by little. <laughs> yeah. um, That's the way you whittle away at it. There, there were a lot of um, very ignorant and and perhaps um, ill-meaning people who were saying that you must have just been mindlessly following Justice Scalia yeah. when the reality was even from day one um, that street ran both ways and there were some very specific instances in which Justice Scalia was following you. Well, we knew that. And the, um, you know, you can't, it's, it's, you're, you're judged now and people are gonna say things and you can't worry about that. Uh, I think what's important is we took an oath. We took an oath to God to do the job a certain way. And we cannot let noise from the cheap seats give you a hard time. It's, it's irrelevant. I agree with Governor DeSantis uh, that the, the, background, the, the, the background noise, the, 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 the cognoscenti, the literati, cannot be people who force you to say that two plus two equals five. Uh, you have simply, ha you have to hold uh, your ground. And, I, I, and in terms of Justice Scalia, I think, first of all, I trusted him. Uh, and we were good for each other. Uh, in lots of cases, uh, we looked out for each other and we helped each other. We encouraged each other. And he would make fun of me because I would, uh, he would call me like solipsistic or something like that. And, but I liked it. I just, it, it, he would make comments because he thought he was, uh, that sometimes I would like set the outer edge and uh, he didn't want to go quite that far. You were the bloodthirsty one and he was the faint hearted one. Well, but I told him when I got to the court that I would help him to look like a moderate. <laughs> And look what I've and, done for him. And so you did. <laughs> How long did it take you? It was a very, very tough year. Ended with Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Um, again, it's in the public record that your position was originally the majority position. Didn't work out that way. Um, very draining for a lot of people who went through that. Um, it was raining for you. <laughs> how, um, I wasn't even my case. <laughs> um, but it was still draining for you. <laughs> it was a tough year. Um, how long did it take for you to um, sort of get your bearings and feel like you were comfortable in the new role everything was firing on all cylinders the way you wanted it to? You know, I don't know if you ever get there. Uh, I think every year you go in and you self-scout yourself and uh, you, you, you start all over again. But so I said to the chief, when I first got to the court, Chief Justice Rehnquist, I, I like the old timers. I love that court. I love talking to them. I love be, talking to Justice O'Connor. They were just wonderful people. So <clears throat> we would have lunch, and we're in that back room in the justice dining room. And I said, you know, I'm young, and they have kids older than I am. And I said, Chief, uh, Chief Justice, again, speaking to Chief Justice Rehnquist, I have no idea why I'm here. I can understand why you're here, understand why Sandra's here. How did I, what am I doing here? And Chief Justice Rehnquist, in his inimical way, says, Clarence, your first five years, you wonder how you got here. After that, you wonder how your colleagues got here. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, was you it get, true? Uh, um, Let the record reflect that I refuse to answer. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll talk later. The, um, so Justice White, who was phenomenal, just a good man and very kind to me, Justice White said, yeah, it takes about five years to figure thing out, things out. 
but you really haven't arrived at the court until one of your opinion comes back to bite you. <laughs> and I have been bitten. <laughs> so, but it's just, no, it, I think it, I don't think you should ever feel like you're in a comfort zone. Uh, I think every day there are things to think about, to rethink, to, to, to ask yourself, is this right? Uh, to dig a little deeper, to peel the onion a little, another layer. Uh, the, and I think if you become stale, I think you become a bad judge. Uh, I, the, the, I love having my law clerks. I love having another set. I love my old law clerks, our monthly lunches, everything, because each that time we're digging fresh ground, we're turning the soil over, you know? We're thinking, uh, looking at it from another direction, looking at it from another angle and another, with, with different light, and uh, asking different questions. That's why it's important to have clerks who don't all come from the same pedigree, who don't all come from the same background. You know? <clears throat> Harvard, Yale, Chicago, Florida. <laughs> uh, um, no, we have others. Georgia, we I have, know, I yeah, know, I know. yeah. Oh, LSU, yeah. you know? Um, let's talk about your judicial philosophy. Um, I don't know if you, I have one, though. Well, you are the most consistent, principled, committed originalist in at least over a century. Um, what's most amazing about that to me is this doesn't seem like something that really took any time to develop. Um, you went on the court with a relatively short track record on the DC circuit. Um, None of our cases on the circuit court were you know, deep dives into first principles. And you get there and you know, right from the get-go, um, you are just hitting it out of the park. Um, how did you come to that way of thinking and, and so quickly and so forcefully from the very beginning? Well, <clears throat> you know, I, uh, first of all, let me just give some credit to you and your co-clerks, just that it, you all were just great and honest, and think of all the things that we got to talk about that year, and it would not have happened without you all. But I'd like to give early sort of antecedent credit to the great man, my grandfather. Um, these were people who were disenfranchised. You disenfranchise people when you make stuff up, when you change the rules, when words don't mean things. Uh, I was in Waco, Texas a few years ago, and a gentleman from the audience asked, said, asked me about textualism and about originalism and what it meant. And I knew he wasn't a lawyer, he was in cowboy boots, it looked like he just came in off the range. And he's a very plain spoken fellow. And I said to him, <clears throat> if you see a stop sign, what do you do? And he said, stop. I said, that makes you an originalist and a textualist. <laughs> I think, I truly think regular people are that way, that words have to mean things, right. that language has to communicate something, that it may get ambiguous or complicated at some level, but I think what we have done to regular people with all this sort of fancy footwork and double entendres and levels of generalities is to disenfranchise ordinary people. People like my grandparents. As my grandfather would say, to, son, that's a fast talking fellow from New York. <laughs> um, the, I think we are obligated when we interpret the people's constitution to make sense of it. 
and to be plain spoken. <clears throat> I don't think it's really that complicated to, um, I guess, of course, when you look at the Constitution, you look at certain words, you look at some of the common law, it can be a bit complicated. But I always think, you know, I met your parents. Right. They were bright people. But I think if we sit here and start playing word, and your father was a doctor. Right. But he started playing word games. He'd, we'd lose him in some of this legal, legal mumbo jumbo. That's not right. He's a citizen. And I think we are obligated to not play these word games and to not uh, pretend that we see something, that we're suddenly oracles. And they can't look at the word due process and see what that means. Because in there, in the, in, in right in the corners and the crevices, it has a secret meaning that can only be accessed by a few of us in Black Rose. That's nonsense. <laughs> the governor mentioned stare decisis. That's Latin. You've, you've written. Uh, <laughs> you've written pretty aggressively. Uh, Not about, really. Well. Let's take, for instance, the time you invited reconsideration of Calder, v. Calder Bull. versus Bull, uh, yeah. decided in 1798. <laughs> Pretty aggressive, I would think. No, just careful. I mean, I don't think you should discriminate based on age. <laughs> All right, how about deference? Um, I remember um, when I was clerking for you, the orthodox Federalist Society legal conservative view was pro-deference. We mm -hmm. believed in judicial restraint, um, the you know, icons of the movement were Ed Meese, Judge Bork, mm -hmm. early Justice Scalia, who was the greatest champion of Chevron. Mm -hmm. And some of the voices we hear today from the other side of that, you know, Don McGahn and Neil Gorsuch, they weren't around back then. No, they're young guys. One person <laughs> um, who was expressing skepticism at the time was you. Because I ran an agency. And why would you defer to an agency? Nobody elected me. Well, you ran, you ran it. <laughs> it never made sense to me. And when Chevron was decided, I was chairman of EEOC, my reaction was, wait a minute, this is a license to steal. I mean, you're just saying, go find ambiguity and do whatever the heck you want to do. How does, that, how does that not, how does that fit? And so what I did then once is, is I wanted then, that led to the, trying to figure out why this government, why, why three separate branches, why legislative, why judicial, why executive, why federalism, why enumerated powers? So we spent hours working on that. And if you let agencies slip around that, and there's no review. We're going to give the same treatment that you gave the royal courts. Oh, the royal courts, the king's guys found this. Let's defer to them. You know, what have we become? What are we undoing? How do you have the liberty that's supposed to be protected by the structures? That's all I'm saying. And that's, I ask. So it's, it's, I mean, you may have an answer to it, but I give Justice Scalia credit. He and I would have long conversations about it. He was a greater man than we've given, than I think most people even know. He is, I would go to his, <clears throat> Justice Scalia was an honest man. I would, we would sit and we would talk. And never once in 25 years did he seem, did, would he say, uh, absolutely not, I, this is what I think, and that's the end of it. Never once. 
Never once did, you know, they try to paint him as an ogre or something. Not once did I see that. Every time I sat with him, we sat as friends. We sat as people who trusted each other, even when we disagreed. And in time, look at his writings on Chevron. Look at his writings on deference. And there was so much more he was thinking about before his untimely death. He was a true friend. And so I don't think that, 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 I think that each of us is fallible. And sometimes we look at things differently. But if you have people you trust, people whose word you trust, who happen to disagree, and that's one of the dangers, by the way, what's going on in the universities. When, when we were in the universities, you and I might disagree as, as students. We might vehemently disagree, but we disagreed as friends. We disagreed as colleagues. Sometimes we would lubricate our conversations with, <laughs> with other items, a beer or something. But we would debate. And 10 years from now, at a reunion, we'd still be arguing as friends. Look at what we're doing today. You disagree with someone, it's animus, they're, they're this-a-phobe, that-a-phobe. Try to silence them. That, and, and now I think they're about to silence the Federalist Society, So what I, as I hear. So I guess I can't well, come that, here. Some I may us, have to join. Some of us are <laughs> fighting back. Yeah, but I just think that this is... I just think that we used to figure out ways to debate and to learn from each other and to sharpen each other. We did that with Justice Scalia. I've seen it on the court. And the sad thing for me is to see the failure to uh, allow that to start and begin and to grow at the uh, collegiate or level or even at the law schools where debate is being stifled. So, but anyway, my point is that the, I think what happens is we all changed. There are some opinions that I look at now that I said who, I mean it's sort of like, my, my son who's a great guy, he's the nicest guy you ever want to meet and a funny guy. So he calls me up one day out of the blue and he says, Dad, did you notice that when people do something really stupid, they first say, hold my beer. So, I just, I don't know what hold my beer has to do with it. But, or they say, watch this. And, you know, I just, I just think that, I don't know why I said that. <laughs> I always think of, my son makes me laugh. The guy's a funny dude. But I just think sometimes we all do things and we all have a whole my beer moment. And later on, we look back at it and we say, what was I thinking? <laughs> what was I thinking when I wrote that opinion? How could I have reached that conclusion? And if you have a friend who sits with you and whom you trust, you see it a little bit earlier and a little bit more clearly. Now, it isn't as poignant in the legal context or in the judicial context as it would be if we were like jumping off a cliff and doing something stupid like that. But it does happen. And I think we are all better when we learn how to listen to other people. But in any case, the, um, and with, with Chevron and as with other things, we all learn lessons. And we all, the, the beauty of being, and you, you see it where you are, the beauty is in debating and discussing and reading and thinking about these things. I know we're over the hard break, and I'm sure no one minds, but let me just ask you one more, one more thing, which is the movie. Um, have you seen it? No. Uh, it's called Created Equal. Um, it's a wonderful movie. I have seen it. I highly recommend it to everyone. Um, my question for you is, um, you had written the autobiography, My Grandfather's Son, a uh, very moving, personal book about your life story. 
Um, so now, why do the movie, why do the, uh, or let others do the um, movie on top of that? It was not my idea. Um, uh, the, my wife thought it's, the people who care about me wanted it done because the, of the very successful propaganda, sort of libelous, slanderous propaganda that takes hold uh, it, against all of us to one degree or another. And they thought that it would be a way to counter some of that so that at least you have the truth that's sitting there if people are interested in it. Um, one of the things that, and I hope you don't confront it, but one of the things that has happened in the last almost four decades that I've been in public life is you watch people make a gargoyle of your life. Um, they distort, they lie, they dissemble, they uh, mischaracterize, and they turn you into someone you don't even know. Uh, you learn how to live with the discomfort or the awkwardness of a perception that has nothing to do with you, uh, but maintaining the life that, the real life that exists. It is, I think for some people, it is more difficult than others. Uh, but people who care about you uh, often tend to want you to respond to it. And I think it's more their idea than it is mine. I try to focus on just doing my work. But in the years it started, the distortions actually started back in 1980, from 1980 on. And it's been a long journey. And I think some people just simply want it corrected. And I have no idea how someone who has never met me or uh, knows nothing about me would ever know who I really am. Uh, so that's why I wrote the book. Uh, I actually wrote that in order to establish and vindicate my grandparents' effort and what my nuns did. Uh, the, they did so much. They have made it possible for me to be here. And it seems as though that was being desecrated. The movie is two hours of Justice Thomas in his own voice, telling his life experiences, life lessons. Um, it is spellbinding, just as our 40 minutes with the justice have been spellbinding. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please joining me in thanking the great Clarence Thomas.